All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on electric vehicle uptake and charging the consumer perspective. My name is David Pointing. I work for the Australian Power Institute, and we're really happy to have you joining us. Uh, some housekeeping as we kick things off and we wait for our attendees to join us. So I suppose just to give you a sense, we've got 250 people registered for the webinar today. And we note that probably a few of them want to catch it as a recording. So to let you know that this webinar is being recorded for both the presentation and the Q&A session at the end. So keep that in mind that you'll also be able to access the recording later. Uh, and another important thing to do as we bring together uh, a community of people from around, not just Australia, but in fact, around the world with some international participants is to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters that we meet on today and to recognize their continuing connection to the lands, the waters and the community and to pay our respects to the people, their cultures and their elders past present and emerging. And with that, I'd like to pass over to my colleague, Monaf, to take you a bit further into the webinar. Thanks, Monaf. Thanks, Dave. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this electric vehicle uptake and charging the consumer perspective webinar. This webinar is part of the electric vehicle EV integration project, which is a two year search project funded by Energy Network Australia and the Center for New Energy Technologies in collaboration with the Australian Power Institute and the University of Melbourne. So this webinar is the first webinar since the start of the EV integration project in September last year. The project is still ongoing with expected completion in late 2022. The purpose of this webinar is to share the findings of the literature study that the University of Melbourne research team have done in the last few months, covering a number of national and international projects focusing on customer adoption and charging of EVs. The EV integration project falls under the Australian Strategic Program, ASTP. The ASTP program is a collaboration between Energy Networks Australia and the Australian Power Institute, aiming to provide funding for research projects which have the potential to bring improvements in the asset management and network performance for electricity utilities, as well as exploring non-network solutions. Thank you all for attending today. Uh, now I hand it over to Nando from the University of Melbourne to introduce the project, the research team, and the speaker. Thank you. I need it. Thank you very much, Monaf, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as Monaf mentioned, uh, this project, uh, which is a partnership, you know, of API, C4Net, Energy Network of Australia and the University of Melbourne. It started recently in September 2020, last year, and uh, will run for two years. And uh, we just started, but still there's a very interesting information that we will uh, be sharing with you today. Uh, the first part of the project and the first six months, in, in effect, uh, are related to customer acceptance and expectations uh, around electric vehicles. And that's really what the webinar is today about. Then we will move on, on to distribution and impacts for uh, uh, managed electric vehicles, so the normal adoption of electric vehicles and how the electricity networks are going to uh, react uh, to that. You know, we're talking about voltages, congestion of assets, etc. And we'll see the final report in September later this year. And then we will move into the active management strategies of electric vehicles, so different uh, charging strategies so as to avoid uh, quite costly reinforcements on the distribution networks, but also looking at other opportunities at the whole system level. And this will be seen as well from a technical economic perspective uh, later in the project. So there are many exciting parts, but we of course are starting understanding really uh, what is the customer acceptance and expectations, which is the webinar about. The project team, it's composed of all these lists here. Uh, well, my name is Nando Choa. We have Professor Mancarella that is leading the project as well. And we have Patricia Lavieri, which is uh, your presenter today. And uh, we'll be talking about the customer acceptance. Uh, we have Professor Majid as well from the transport sector. And we have uh, multiple researchers as William, uh, Sharik, and Carmen working in the different analysis done in this uh, project. And of course, uh, this project cannot actually uh, go ahead or proceed in the way that it is 
doing without the support of uh, the different uh, distribution network service providers involved in this particular project. Well, before starting the webinar, I'm passing on to uh, Patricia, just uh, thinking again, the API, uh, C4Net and uh, Energy Networks Australia for their support. Uh, Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nando. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, as Nando already introduced, I, I'm part of the project uh, studying the consumer perspective uh, regarding the adoption of electric vehicles and then use of electricity, uh, so potential impacts that the behavior of the consumers may have uh, uh, on, network, on the electricity networks. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a lecturer in transport uh, at the University of Melbourne. My specialization is in travel behavior and choice modeling. And I have been studying for the past years uh, overall consumer interest adoption and use of new transport technologies and services. Most of my work is uh, regarding connected and automated vehicles, as well as ride hailing and ride sharing services. And more recently I have been uh, expanding uh, towards bike sharing, electric bicycles, electric scooters, and now electric vehicles as well. Uh, another interesting component of my research is the impact of information and communication technology together with the new transport technologies on uh, travel demand and now also on uh, electricity demand. So uh, the initial part of, of, of the consumer investigation that uh, Nando mentioned uh, is the literature review. And this is what I'm gonna be presenting here today. Literature reviews can, uh, contents can be pretty extensive and full of nuances. So since it's a literature review, I'll uh, try to provide more of a overview uh, of findings uh, in, in a frequent, frequently asked question format to try to keep uh, the depth and the content interesting, uh, but, but it's still uh, informative. Uh, at the end, I have already added uh, some questions and answers to the questions that the audience submitted in advance but uh, hopefully we'll have uh, time and interest and, and we'll go over uh, more questions that you can send uh, through the chat. So, well, where are we in terms of uh, electric vehicle uh, update right now? Uh, globally, sales have uh, reached uh, 2.1 million uh, in 2019, and then the overall stock reached uh, close to 7 million. The majority of these vehicles are in China. And then uh, following China, there is Europe and, and the United States. Uh, but overall, in, in terms of uh, market share globally, the share of electric vehicles is still uh, still uh, very low, only 1% of, of the world stock. The countries that uh, show the highest penetration, the country that shows the highest penetration is Norway with 13%. And this, this number is gonna uh, be uh, important as we start talking about the type of consumers, because as I will mention later, Norway is the only country where they're getting close from going from early adopters to the early majority. Everywhere else, pretty much electric vehicles owners are still innovators or early adopters. Uh, however, despite this, these figures that may sound uh, impressive, I mean, not the proportions, but the overall numbers, uh, there is a slowdown in sales that has been uh, observed and 
that's due to a car market contraction overall. And in this sense, the IC, so the internal combustion engine, engine uh, market is contracting faster than the electric vehicle market. So in that sense, uh, it is kind of uh, positive. Uh, but overall, globally, uh, there is a, a, a car market con contraction and the initial effects of, of COVID are, are is extenu extenuating this, this contraction. And another phenomenon that uh, is being observed in these countries that have already started the adoption of electric vehicles in the early 2010, uh, there, there is slowly a uh, uh, start to reduce uh, purchase subsidies. And uh, in China, for example, they cut their subsidies uh, to about half of it. And they quickly observed a drastic reduction in, in sales. And, and they actually decided to revoke the cut and uh, extend it to 2022, such the impact that it had. Another reason that, uh, another cause for sales to, to be slowing down is the, that consumers, as they are becoming more aware of electric vehicles and they are also seeing the quick uh, upgrade of electric vehicles and, and greater variety coming to the market, they are deciding to wait because there is an expectation that in one year, the next year, it's going to be way better. So I'm going to wait one more year. So this expectation around the quick evolution of technology is also uh, holding consumers back. Uh, in terms of local uptake, Australia and New Zealand are part of the 20 countries with um, market share that is greater than 1%. The fleets are, in terms of totals of Australia and New Zealand, are, are kind of similar, but the total fleet of overall vehicles of New Zealand is way smaller, it's one fifth of Australia's. So the penetration in New Zealand is, is way more significant than it is in Australia. In Australia, it's observed uh, uh, an, an increase in consumer interest. This increase has been uh, steady. Uh, New South Wales leads in overall numbers of vehicles, but uh, uh, the capital territory uh, leads in terms of percentage. Uh, and what the what the, the the market, what the car manufacturers think that is is missing, it's that the country at a federal level uh, uh, enforces more fuel fuel efficiency standards, uh, offer it uh, consumer incentives. And, and, and develop EV sales targets. So from a, from a car manufacturing standpoint, this is what is, is missing for, for the market to, to really start to grow. Uh, New Zealand has more incentives than Australia. For example, the uh, electric vehicle owners are exempt from paying road user charges until December, 2021. They have lower ACC. They have uh, preferential parking, uh, and there also there has also been a huge influx of used uh, short-range EVs. Nissan leads to to New Zealand, which uh, contributes to to the larger fleet. Uh, so, okay, this is the overview of, of the of, of the take in terms of number. So. What, are you, what influences the uptake, right? And what influences the uptake from the consumer point of view? So for consumers need to understand and um, be knowledgeable about what types of EVs are there. And, and, and this knowledge is gonna influence the, the, 
the uptake. Of course, the initial costs of uh, EVs also uh, has, a, has a large influence in the uptake. The charging technology and understanding about it will also influence uh, the uptake and, and understanding about charging locations and charging infrastructure will also uh, have an influence together with policy incentives and regulations. And finally, uh, the type of consumers uh, will also react differently to each of these other dimensions. And, and, and therefore they will uh, have a likelihood of adopting uh, electric vehicles that, that is different. So I'll go over the uh, definitions that are so just to make sure maybe everybody here are, is an expert, but I just wanna make sure that uh, we are all on the same page. So types of EVs, so there are hybrid cars which recharge the batteries, but uh, based on um, braking, for example, but uh, do not, are not actually plugged to, to the electric grid. And these cars are therefore not considered electric vehicles. So basically we have then two types of electric vehicles, which are the plug-in hybrid cars and the plug-in electric cars. The plug-in hybrid cars still has a, a combustion engine and has a battery that is smaller than the electric car. So the range that it can run on electricity is smaller. Uh, and, and the plug-in electric vehicles, the PEVs, uh, also known as BEVs, they, they are now divided into short range and long range as the technology uh, evolved uh, long range are, are becoming uh, more prevalent. Uh, I mean, I put here more or less an estimate of where, what is the divide between a short range and, and a long range, let's say 250 kilometers, but this is, this is just uh, a, a, an estimate. There, there is no, not a clear definition. Starting at this range, this vehicle is considered long range. The fact is that um, more and more long range vehicles are, 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 are appearing in the market and are becoming more and more popular. In terms of charging technology, I mean, there is a lot of technicalities that even are, are, are even uh, beyond my, my knowledge and uh, but what really matters in, in terms of, of the consumer, the decision maker is understanding uh, how fast uh, it's it, it gonna charge my vehicle, right? How quickly my vehicle is gonna be charged. So uh, we are usually talking about a level, level of charge, which is the power output and it can go from level one to three, three, three. And the third one is fast charging. Uh, level one and two are the most prevalent in residential charging. And then there is this level two fast that is available in some uh, public chargers and that is an uh, in between uh, uh, a level two and a fast charger. And as I mentioned, more than the actual technical terms and, and, and definitions, uh, what really matters to the consumer here is understanding uh, how much range I'm gonna get in how much time, depending on, on, on the charger level. In terms of charging locations too, so before when, uh, there were only internal combustion engine vehicles. There was just the status quo alternative, right? So you need to fuel your vehicle, you go to a service station. There is not really a choice there. While now with electric vehicle, you are adding alternatives to, to your choice set, right? So you, you can uh, choose 
where you're gonna charge your vehicle and probably associated to this location choice, there is gonna be a level of charge. So the type of charger that's gonna be available, for example, you're not gonna have a fast charger in your residence. So uh, EV owners are have uh, uh, a greater uh, number of, of alternatives and situations that they need to think about when they are uh, considering charging. And also the charging episodes take uh, usually longer than refueling your vehicle would take. So the decision is a little bit more complex because maybe you wanna, uh, you wanna couple your charging session with some other activity. For example, uh, in terms of destination charging, if chargers are available in shopping malls or gyms and parks or at work, then uh, the electric vehicle owner can can consider to to couple the uh, the this activity with with the charging episode. There is also the 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 convenience of being able to to charge your vehicle in your house overnight if you have access to. To, to, to residential charging. And we're gonna talk about that uh, uh, in a couple of slides. So in terms of charging infrastructure, here is an interesting number. If, if you remember the number that I showed about uh, number of electric vehicles, the number of chargers, it's pretty much the same. Uh, but here in this number, 7.3 million, it's included uh, both uh, private, so residential uh, work chargers and uh, public chargers. So here you can see how the number breaks. It's a majority of chargers are in homes or, or apartment buildings or uh, work locations. I believe I deleted this, this part of the sentence by mistake. Uh, while uh, the number of public chargers is a lot smaller uh, with uh, almost half a million being slow chargers and 264,000 being fast chargers. And what is interesting is that 81% of these fast chargers are in China. Well, China has the largest market, but also China has a very particular situation compared to Europe, Europe and North America, that is higher density cities. So uh, lower availability of home charging. And as we're gonna discuss later, when you have lower availability of home charging, public fast charging becomes very important. Uh, in Australia, uh, the number is uh, around 2000 uh, public charging stations which equates to uh, one station per nine vehicles ratio, uh, which is considered high uh, if you compare to, to, to some other countries that have even higher penetration rates of EVs. Of course, the higher the penetration of EVs, this ratio is gonna change. Uh, but what is interesting is, can it already be noted by mainstream consumer? And, and the answer to that is probably no. In Canada, for example, they surveyed mainstream consumers about uh, their knowledge of uh, public charging stations. And, and then they uh, compared the location that the individual lived and, and worked with the, the availability of, of charging stations. And they noted that people who don't owe own or use an electric vehicle, they don't notice that this is state, this, these charging stations are there, even if, if they are. Uh, which is, again, an important observation later on when we are talking about uh, perceived barriers to EV adoption by consumers. So, uh, so we talked about uh, these dimensions that the consumer will, will we need to understand when uh, wanting to adopt an electric vehicle. But we also need to understand that uh, to, to, to forecast and, and to 
see how uptake is going to evolve. Uh, we need to to understand the types of, of consumers, right? And so the diffusion of innovation curve is, is a very consolidated uh, theory. And it shows that the initial 2.5% of the consumers that are adopter in the technology are innovators, then you go to the early adopters and, and urban majority and so on. So right now, globally, we are still in an innovator uh, group of users, let's say. And as I mentioned earlier, Norway is the only country which is actually close to reaching a early majority. And why is, it, why is this distinction important? This distinction is important because these consumers are very different. They not only have different social demographics, but they have very different behaviors, uh, both in terms of consumption, but probably also in terms of activity and travel. So uh, not only the purchase of the vehicle, but also uh, how much they travel or how they're going to charge or what type of charges they're going to use, etc. So, you know, veterans and early adopters are known to be uh, risk takers with uh, great financial liquidity, liquidity uh, while the majority are more practicality and uh, they are more driven by practicality and monetary savings. So costs really start uh, to matter to, to the early majority more, much more than to this initial segment of, of consumers, uh, which will impact not in terms of, not only in terms of the purchase of the vehicle again, but also in terms of charging behavior. And this is why it's important to look at literature that has empirical evidence based not only on current use of electric vehicles, but also surveys with uh, prospective owners because these individuals, this is how you can really capture uh, the mainstream consumer at this point, right? Since the technology has not reached them yet. Uh, individual and household uh, travel needs, as I mentioned, we will also, also vary between these groups. So it's very important to, to understand this distinction. Right now, just uh, uh, as, a, as a matter of uh, example, based on uh, different studies from different countries, of course, there is a variation, but the standard uh, EV owner is a male with high income and high education, uh, living in a large household, and by large household, I mean multiple people. Um, these households usually also have multiple cars, including internal combustion engines. Uh, they have, uh, they travel high distance, uh, long distances. And, but the EV is usually the main car. So it's the car usually used by the head of the household who, who is usually this high income, high education male. And so this profile is likely to change as the technology uh, really permeates through the, the, the early majorities. So as I, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, what are some of the motivations and, and barriers um, to, to user acceptance. And here I bring uh, these recent results published by the Electric Vehicle Council, just to illustrate because in the end, they, the perceptions are very similar worldwide. So the motivation to own an electric vehicle is uh, the environmental footprint, uh, but also the running costs, which are way lower than the running costs of an internal combustion vehicle, recharging your, your vehicle in your house uh, costs way less than, than filling your tank. Uh, however, the consumers see many barriers, among them the purchase costs. So let's say you have lower running costs, but the initial investment is still high and higher than internal combustion engines vehicles. So that really uh, prevents people from, from making this choice. Uh, potential buyers also find 
that uh, charging, recharging the vehicle may be inconvenient. Uh, and they suffer from range anxiety, which means that they fear that they, there is not enough charging infrastructure, so that they will not have easy access to charging. Uh, it could be either at home or, or public charging. And they also fear that the driving range of the vehicle, so that the battery range is not gonna be enough. But does that match with what owners think? The truth is that it doesn't. Uh, of course, the purchase costs uh, remains a barrier, but the other three uh, barriers that I mentioned there, they, they once you own the, the electric vehicle and you experience it, and this has been tested also in trials that non-electric vehicle owners are given an electric vehicle to, to use for a couple of weeks or months, uh, so it's not only actual owners, but other people who have experience using it, they actually uh, start perceiving things differently. And they find out that charging at home is actually more, uh, more convenient than going to, to a petrol station. And the driving range is more than sufficient. And we, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, that uh, in an example from Victoria. Uh, so then in that sense, what policies, incentives, and regulations could potentially uh, influence the consumer behavior? Uh, of course, those that are targeting the costs that are identified uh, are likely to, to be the preferred ones by, by users. But here you could see that prospective buyers have very closely actually uh, same level as subsidies you see provision of public charging infrastructure, which again may, might be just a matter of educating them uh, about the availability of, of this or, or the actual need. Uh, what, what is the international experience regarding this? Uh, what, what is best? Uh, the literature shows that it's difficult to to separate because countries that have been successful in, in a quick increase in, in, in EV uptake have used multiple simultaneously. But as I mentioned, uh, monetary incentives in terms of subsidies and, and tax reduction are usually the preferred and most effective. But uh, of course, there are places that massively invested in, in, in charging infrastructure and these investments have paid off. And a good examples of that are Norway and China. And in a study from the UK, they estimate that uh, investments in public charge, excuse me, could uh, increase their uptake by up to 20%. So don't get me wrong, public charging infrastructure may help, but uh, I guess the quick and dirty way is monetary incentives. So, now we can now let, let's let's transition right to the second part that is as we understand a little bit uh, that the uptake is increasing and how we can make it increase uh, faster. Are we ready for the charging demand? And so now we need to understand uh, what are the determinants and dimensions of the charging decisions. So here uh, in this graph I have. Well, the decision maker is the, the driver and the household. They have specific driving patterns. They own a vehicle that will, once they already own an electric vehicle, their vehicle is gonna have a certain uh, range of battery. They will or will not have uh, home charging available and they might have level one or level two charging chargers installed in their house. And they are uh, psychosocial characteristics that result in range anxiety or charging preferences may also vary. So these are characteristics that are 
intrinsic to the user and to the household that uh, will influence, will impact the charging decisions. Then there are the dimensions that are relative to the market and to the infrastructure, and that is the per public charging availability, uh, how much it costs to charge in public charging, uh, where it's located, what are the levels available, uh, what are the policies and incentives in terms of uh, parking and charging now that uh, we consider that uptake is, is already uh, given, and what are the electricity management programs in place. So these are, uh, let's say, uh, environmental variables that are impacting the, the user decision, and then the user has to basically uh, make four simultaneous decisions, which are uh, where they're going to charge, the charging location, how frequently, uh, which level they're going to use, and therefore the duration, and at what time of the day. So now we're going to discuss this, this four decisions and, and, and what, what the literature observes uh, in terms of behaviors regarding, regarding these four dimensions. Uh, so where do users prefer to charge? Uh, 50 to 90 percent of charging events uh, observed in, in Europe and, and North America. And here in this charging behavior uh, component of the literature review, I'll be really focusing on Europe and, and North America because, as I mentioned earlier, China and other uh, Asian countries have cities that are way denser than uh, the, 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 the Australian uh, uh, cities. So it's not as comparable as, uh, let's say, European cities and, and maybe some uh, American cities too. So uh, followed by uh, residential charging, the second preferred place for charging is the workplace. For commuters, it's observed that between 15 and 40% of charging uh, events take place uh, at work. And then for regular destination charging locations, users uh, like to have the, the, the ability to charge at supermarkets and shopping facilities. Uh, so that is destination charging is preferred over service stations, even in cases that uh, that fast charging is available. But uh, we're gonna discuss fast charging is still very important for long distance travel. Uh, level two residential charging uh, has been increasing and, and, and that ensures a little bit of faster uh, charging for the long range uh, electric vehicles, which are growing and becoming the, the the majority of, of the market. Uh, one characteristic that has been observed that is very important for uh, electricity networks planning is that the demand for for charging is concentrated and for residential charging is concentrated uh, not only in time but also in space, which means that certain neighborhoods are more likely to have a lot of electric vehicles while other neighborhoods will have zero electric vehicles and, and that creates a, a, a huge imbalance in, in space too. So if people are charging at the same time and uh, they are also uh, concentrated in space, this, this creates uh, localized peaks. And this has been observed by, by the literature, especially in North America. Uh, different consumer groups will prioritize time, money, and convenience, convenience differently. And there, now with long range EVs too, there is a, a growth in individuals uh, trading uh, residential charging by free destination charging, especially at work. And, and that should become even more prominent as the early majority starts owning electric vehicles since these consumers are going to be even more driven by monetized savings. Uh, 
so here uh, I just wanted to to give a, a, a quick uh, I'm already running on 40 minutes, but uh, just wanted to give a quick uh, overview on how to, because I did a, a short exercise for the state of Victoria to determine the potential for residential charging. So I'll just go over this very quickly. So how, how can we determine the potential for residential charging if we want to do planning and we don't really have the specific data on on individuals' ability to charge at home. Well, home charging usually requires off-street parking and parking spot proximity to an electric outlet. So if you know that people have access to that, they will probably be able to charge at home. Uh, and we already know that this is less likely in apartment buildings. But if you don't have information about parking, maybe you can use drilling type as uh, a proxy. And for example, in this study, they found out that uh, detached houses are four times more likely to have access to charging than apartments. And even if you don't have any of that, you could even make a, a, a simpler examination by looking at a residential density. And to understand whether users are going to have level one or level two in their residences, you really need to look at home ownership because if you live in a household that you own, you are more likely to pay for changes in the electric, electricity, electrical installation. And that's required for level two. So the investment required for level two installation is usually observed just uh, by individuals that uh, live in, in, in dwellings that they own. Uh, so here, just uh, very quickly, did this exercise considering these this variables and assumptions that I mentioned. And we estimated that uh, across all of Victoria, uh, around 87% of the dwellings are probably capable of installing and having level one charging, while 66% would be able to have level two. And then we go further and we examine well, what is the potential for exclusive uh, residential charging in the case of Victoria? And to do that, we look at uh, travel patterns, right? How much do household travels, uh, households travel? And we observe that uh, nine out of 10 households uh, drive less than 200 kilometers per day. So technically this individuals could be able to charge only at home and they would not require uh, any to stop and recharge anywhere even if you are very safe on, on your on your bed and assume that an average uh, electric vehicle will have a range of only 200 kilometers so if we if we merge that with, with what we found out in, in the previous table, we would say that around 78% of households uh, in Victoria could uh, do uh, reach all their activity and travel needs uh, only by charging at home. Okay, so a little bit more of uh, uh, the, the going back to the to the charging uh, choice dimensions. What are the charging durations and frequencies observed? Uh, North American Europe, three to four times a week, less than four hours. And that's a very interesting result because that indicates actual behavior rather than empty to full charges. So it's not that individuals are charging, uh, oh, my, my car was running low, I'm gonna charge. Uh, in EV owners are actually following a habit of, okay, I get back from work and, and I plug my car a couple of times a week and I leave it plugged for, for four hours or for a period of time until I go to bed or whatever. So uh, it's really indicating uh, actual behavior rather than uh, on the go, let's say. Uh, of course, as long-range EVs uh, 
increase even more their ranges and the penetration, this pattern may change because of course this, this average have been uh, measured with uh, observational data that includes uh, different types of electric vehicles. Uh, the charging sessions using fast chargers are usually shorter than 30 minutes, which is good because uh, with fast chargers, uh, the tendency is that as your uh, state of charge or battery level increases, the, the, the time required to add a little bit more charge increases. So it slows down the charging process as time passes. So you, you really want uh, to have your public infrastructure uh, planned uh, so that charging sessions in, in fast public chargers don't, don't go uh, beyond 30 minutes. Uh, when do user chargers, and this is very relevant for electricity management. Well, if no management is in place uh, after work, uh, people will arrive uh, home after work and they will charge. And if they are charging at work, they will arrive at work and then they will charge. Uh, however, studies that uh, look at fixed time of use tariffs, uh, they see a shift, of course, not after work. Usually uh, the change in, in prices occurs at 11 p.m., for example. So then you observe that uh, users will go and start their charging sessions as soon as the tariff uh, decreases, right? So then you have the potential of creating a second peak of at, for example, 11 p.m. And as I mentioned earlier, it, it has also been observed, especially in North America, that uh, the, the local peaks are, are, are very much accentuated by an evil spatial distribution of EV ownership. Okay, so that leads us to uh, manage charging. And I really wanna go quick here so that we have time for, for the for questions. Uh, well, I trials and uh, surveys that have uh, elicited uh, preferences of people who have experience using EVs uh, have a consensus that users tend to prefer managed charging than unmanaged charging because of the monetary savings. Uh, however, with Within managed charging, there are uh, many dimensions to right? So managed charging can be managed by the user and then the user can be following a fixed time of use tariffs or there could be dynamic pricing, which means using smart meters that uh, have hourly measures and, and, and can show price fluctuations like I believe in, in Finland, it's like that. Uh, so uh, there is uh, so there is a variation between uh, whether it's going to be fixed user or system managed. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, it's called centralized smart charging. That is, you plug your vehicle, uh, but your your charger actually communicates with the network so that uh, the, the, the charging, the, the amount of energy that is sent, let's say to your vehicle, uh, fluctuates over time in response to the demand. So if the demand of electricity increases, your, uh, the amount of energy sent to your vehicle, power sent to your vehicle decreases and uh, uh, and does uh, <clears throat> uh, it evens the 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 demand? It softens uh, the peak for electricity demand, but the use the user has it, right. So it's not guaranteed that by the time you thought you'd have finished charging your vehicle, it's gonna be really charged. And the third dimension here in the types of charging management, 
can be uh, regarding the compensation, right? Because uh, compensation can can be due through reward system or actual uh, uh, monetary savings, and uh, so the literature shows uh, examples that are of trial stacking both types of of uh, of systems. Uh, in terms of effectiveness of uh, managed charging, the initial uh, addition is the main challenge, uh, and that's that that's uh, where you see also uh, the difference of uh, trials and, and reality. Because, uh, for example, in this electric nation uh, smart charging trial, uh, users are informed, hey, this is your smart charging option. And, and then they test different configurations of smart charging schemes, of managed charging schemes. While in reality, maybe the user does have some of these options, but the user is not aware or doesn't, uh, or, or they don't think uh, it's worth um, uh, trying it. So, uh, the initial, the initial uh, addition to the to the to the program is the is, is a big barrier. Uh, this study, for example, showed that the the ratio, sorry, that the, the, the total of peak and off peak prices need to be at least six to one, so that consumers will show initial interest uh, to to participate in these types of schemes. Uh, yeah. This this is trial in the UK. Try different uh, apps, smartphone app configurations to manage uh, charging, and they saw that asking people to enter their trip plans and then giving them uh, enough battery to enough charge to complete their trip plans was not effective. People don't want to don't want to enter their trip plans. Uh, and then have just the amount of, of battery that is that is enough to do that. Uh, however, apps that individuals have the choice of whether they want to be engaged in centralized smart charging in one day and then the next day they just want to charge immediately. Uh, this type of choice is something that the user is interested in. Uh, so. <laughs> I'm really getting getting long here. Uh, so what about uh, FASIC public charging? And I will uh, make this my last slide and then I'll go to questions and answers. So uh, the availability of overall of, uh, of fast public charging is associated to observe the increases in, in, in vehicle kilometers traveled. So this association is, is observed. However, uh, it's not as used or as perceived as necessary by, by users on a regular basis. It, it's more important when in long distance travel corridors where people want to travel long distance or in very dense urban areas where there is a low home charging availability. One needs to be careful when deploying uh, fast public charging in dense urban areas is to make sure that this is not uh, actually incentivizing the use of private cars over mass transport. Uh, the proximity to fast public charging can increase the success of diminished uh, control over residential charging. So, uh, it does play an important role uh, to help uh, users uh, accept the laws of control that they have when, when centralized smart charging is happening. Uh, and the parking and tariff structures are very important to ensure the efficient use of public fast charging infrastructure. So with that, I think I, I have uh, uh, already made most of my summarizing points uh, throughout my presentation. So I can make this presentation available to you.
you guys are interested in. The next steps in our project is after this literature review, we're gonna do an online survey and we're gonna explore further some of these questions that we have explored and some additional ones. So now I'll open for Q and A's. I had pre-selected a couple of questions to answer, uh, but I guess I will just uh, actually open the floor to, 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 to general questions because we just have five minutes left. And maybe if David wants to help me with that, uh, that would be wonderful. Hello, thank you, Patricia. Um, we have a number of questions in our Q&A uh, channel there. So if you can jump on and have a look in that, Patricia, you'll be able to see those. So we have some from Marcus and from Ian and others, Yo Chai and a few others. So if you, can you yeah, see Yeah, so that? Marcus is asking about uh, hydrogen uh, cell cars and yes i have uh, and whether i have any comments on, on the consumer uptake on that and this is something that uh, was not included in our in our video so i really don't yeah. cannot speak about that but i would say that's certain uh certain concepts of uh Diffusion of innovations should apply similarly. Great. Um, uh, we've got a, a question from Ian on uh, where are the L1 to L4 charging definitions sourced from? What's the source of those? Okay, yeah, I have that in this slide. Uh, I mean, do you want to go back to that? Oh, so, if, yeah, if you've covered that, then comfortable. Yeah, jump maybe to. it's too far away back. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I suggest you have a look oh, there you the, go. The yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, look, the charging range rate will vary depending on your battery size, right? So these are just uh, approximate uh, estimates. Yeah. And then uh, I, I believe that the other uh, the charger level characteristics, they, there may be some slightly differentiation from one source to another, but I, I would say that roughly these are, these are the, the yeah. yeah, great. Yeah, have a look at, you've got some other questions from Yo Chai and Wendy and Scott. Have a look through those, please. I'll, I'll jump uh, in and answer well, a question uh, from Pete. Pete has asked if the, uh, if the recording will be made available. The recording will be made available for everyone. And I was just to note for the people that are in here, there were some challenges that some people were having in actually getting into the webinar. Some issue with the registration that I've just been uh, talking with Zoom about. And we have fixed it, but we're not quite sure why it occurred. So we will be making the webinar available, but Patricia, will the slides be available as well or only as part yeah, of Yeah, I can definitely make them available uh, okay. somehow. Uh, Thank you. Or, or if not now, when we release the report in April, we, we can have these slides as, as an appendix or as an additional file that is released. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah so, so yeah. For really. sure. So yeah, this, this I will answer this quick question about your child is, is very interesting. He's asking why uh, we are not considering autonomous and shared electric vehicles. And yeah, we uh, and, and, and we are focusing on uh, electric vehicle ownership. Uh, well, this was something that was decided as being outside the scope of the project, but as a person who studies <laughs> the adoption of autonomous and shared vehicles. Uh, one, for, for charging purposes, 
if you have a fleet, so let's say if everybody adopts shared autonomous electric vehicles, charging and balancing the demand of charge is going to be so much easier because you have decentralized fleets, right, that are that can use optimization algorithms to decide when they're gonna charge. So that's way easier than having individual consumers that will just like decide whenever and how they're gonna charge, right? So it's way more random or maybe not so random behavior, but way more difficult to manage this demand than to manage uh, a fully shared uh, autonomous vehicle demand of electricity for charging. So I guess this is this is working with individual vehicle owners is the most difficult scenario, I would say. Alrighty. Well we're close to our scheduled time here, Patricia, if you have any other yeah so yeah thank you very much everyone. Uh, I'm sorry I talked a little bit too much in the beginning. I guess I, I was too excited. <laughs> uh, I had addressed some other questions here. Uh, so I, I, anyways, I, I, we can make this available later. And so, yeah, I'd like to, to thank everyone for attending. I'd like to take that, thank Dave D for, for organizing uh, this webinar and, and taking for, and thanking all the sponsors as well of the project and all my uh, collaborators in this project. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, three student research assistants who have also helped in, in this research. Uh, so thank you everyone. And there will be next steps and there's gonna be a, a survey with Australian consumers to, to answer more questions about the consumer acceptance. And have I forgotten something David, that I had to say in there? I said not only to say, look, there, this project is, is a two year long project. This is the first effort to share some of the outcomes of that project beyond the project team and the sponsors. So certainly there'll be more information available as the project proceeds. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you up to date with that through different channels. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, we hope you've got value out of this today. There will be a recording that I'll share with everyone. And yes, yeah, stay, stay connected with ourselves, with ENA, with C4Net uh, to see where this project goes moving forward. And obviously with Patricia and the Melbourne Uni team. So thank you, Patricia and, and Nando and Manaf and, and thanks everyone else for your time.